I feel like instead of not in my name, which I wrote in 2003 in response to the U.S.'s war on terror, that I should have written over my dead body. Over my dead body will you occupy countries, bomb civilians, kill more children, letting history take its course over the graves of the nameless. Over my dead body will you erode the very freedoms you have claimed to fight for. Over my dead body will you supply weapons and funding for the annihilation of families on foreign soil. It is not simply an idea that one should be willing to die for their beliefs or principles, but rather that there are hundreds of thousands, in fact millions, tens of millions that have died at the behest of racialized capitalism and its imperial machine, which we feed with our labor. And if we are to bring the machine to an end, to halt its progress, we must indeed be willing to face what Thomas Sankara faced in Burkina Faso, what Marielle Franco faced in Brazil, what Patrice Lumumba faced in the Congo, what Chairman Fred Hampton faced in Chicago, what Berta Caceres faced in Honduras, what Steve Biko faced in South Africa, what Leonard Peltier has faced for 48 years in the U.S. penitentiary, what Asada Shakur has faced for 45 years in hiding, and what Ibrahim Traore of Burkina Faso is facing right now. The fact is that the ruling class of the imperial machine is willing to kill. And we must find at least the organizing strength to halt our labor to kill the machine. Perhaps you do not know that the industrial era followed the colonial era and that all modern machines were built on the workings of the plantation. Which is why if you pull apart a machine to this day, a camera, a car, a vacuum cleaner, an engineer will describe the engine in terms of master and slave. Even in computer programming, the word robot in its Slavic origins means forced labor or slave. It's a way of looking at why we were robbed of our religions, our culture, our God, our language, our familiar relations. We tend to think, and for good reason, that they saw and treated us as animals when one could say we were the technology forging the new world. It was beat out of us in an attempt to make us robots. We have worked under the command of a system with no return not fought for with petitioners and martyrs who said, I may not make it to the mountaintop, and here we are. We have petitioned and cried to our government for well over a year now with no amends. What is left but to collectively halt our labor, not to actually put our bodies on the line, but to take our bodies off and out of the lines and means of production. The media has coined a lot of terms over the past year. One of those terms is anti-genocide protesters. But aside from the rabid Zionist and the corporate heads of weapons manufacturers, etc., who profit from human extermination, who would not characterize themselves as anti-genocide? I imagine that those who even work in weapons manufacturing companies, not the owners, but the workers themselves, would characterize themselves as anti-genocide. My point is, if they can fire weapons for almost 400 consecutive days, and some of us allow ourselves to think, it's out of my hands, there's nothing I can do. What would five days, five consecutive business days of taking what is in our hands, our labor, off the market, collectively? regardless of who you're voting for and regardless of who wins the election, could we bring the world and the brutal acts of our governing bodies dictated by a corporatocracy to a halt? What would it take for just a moment of world-changing solidarity? I know you can't afford to lose a week's pay, but we could certainly pull our resources and feed each other. I know you can't afford to lose your job, but if we could convince everyone in 
the imperial core, the challenge to confront the role of empire, to stand in global solidarity, to halt the means of production, to take a collective vacation, if you will, to make a point. Well, then it might reverberate loud enough when we say, not in my name. But if it's just individuals finding the strength and clarity to stand up here and there, if it's just a few individuals who are anti-genocide, I mean, what is it the resistance says? When they stand up to tanks and 2,000 pound bombs and heavily fortified armies that spin munitions like singles at strip clubs, is the resistance every act not a form of saying over my dead body? This is not to put over emphasis on the role of death and martyrdom. It is to openly question what is the best response to an imperial machine that is willing to kill that will record the sounds of babies crying and play them from armed drones so that anyone who feels empathy, who thinks they can help an ailing child, will be shot when they exit whatever safe space they have found. The ruling class weaponizes our weakness. I'm simply pointing out theirs. They depend on our labor. Now, some may say, so, well, you're a poet. What kind of labor can you withhold? <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> Usually when I sit down to write, I reflect on a phrase that Maya Angelou said when discussing a writing collective she was a part of in Harlem in the mid-70s. What she said was the point of critique for the writers in the group was anything an artist writes should be written with the urgency of what they would write if someone were holding a gun in their mouth. It's a wonderful point of interrogation for any poem. <laughs> Could these be my last words? Yet the thing is, the ruling class behind the ruling parties are essentially holding a gun to our heads right now. Now, I know that is not necessarily the case for everyone. For many, Palestine is way over there. Sudan, Congo, like Rwanda is way over there. Haiti is way over there. Puerto Rico, Hawaii are way over there. I should not have to point out that the occupied land we now stand on is not some proverbial talking point, nor is it way over there. And when our relatives say, land back, they are responding to the centuries-old and ongoing crisis. They are speaking directly to the climate crisis and what happens when those who hold no reverence for the land control the rights to exploit and destroy it. They are speaking directly to land theft and wage theft. They are speaking directly to the health and health care of our people, all people, and the environment. They are speaking of the racialized capitalism that has served as the foundation of the system we find ourselves in to this day. When the Lenny Lenape were confronted by representatives of the Dutch East India Trade Company, the first multinational corporation, for supposed purchase of Manahatta, now known as Manhattan, the idea of land ownership was not shared. In fact, it is said the Lenny Lenape took the gift of currency as a way of saying, thank you, thank you for sharing this land with us, for teaching us how to navigate the climate, for sharing your food, your hospitality, as a response to the many gifts the Lene Lenape had given to the Dutch settlers. But the Dutch were angry after they were, in their minds, had paid a price for the land. They were angry that the Lenape did not take the sum and simply disappeared. That they somehow saw the land and rivers as something that they would share. So the settlers began to repeatedly attack the natives when they would come too close to their settlement and, in fact, decided to build a wall, a 12-foot wall around their settlement to keep the Lene Lenape out. Now, within these walls, which they decided to charge other traveling Europeans, fur traders, etc., to enter, they established a market. At this market, you could buy furs, horses, you could rent slaves. Yes, rent. Uh, you realize not everyone was in a position to buy one, or two or three. Uh, but if you were building a house or tilling land, you could rent enslaved Africans for a week or a weekend. Now, some of y'all, 
might be flashing on the guys that you've seen standing in the parking lot of Home Depot. Like, what are they doing there? Well, this market where you could buy, trade, or barter goods that the Dutch East India Trade Company built within the walls of their settlement on the island of Manhattan still exists to this day in the same exact spot, same exact location. It is called the New York Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange. And you may not think you are buying or renting slaves when stocks rise and fall, but the global, global majority, whose coffee, whose rubber, whose sugar, whose chocolate, whose uranium, whose oil, whose fossils in precious mineral form, whose labor these stocks depend on, would say different. The wall that was built around the settlement no longer exists. The only thing left is the marker that tells you where the northernmost part of that wall was. Wall Street. The wall that was built to keep the Lenny Lenape out. The root chakra of racialized capitalism and settler colonialism exists to this day. Like the wall that is being built to keep out the indigenous subjects of U.S. imperialism, dispos dispossession, and destabilization in the south of this country. So when I ask what would happen if we somehow found the collective solidarity beyond partisan politics and the simple fact that many, if not most, would agree that genocide, particularly as government policy, is not for the people, I ask it with the Lene Lenape and the many indigenous peoples of this land in mind. In his renowned essay on civil disobedience, the poet and essayist Henry David Thoreau stated, most of all, I must see to it that I do not lend myself to the evils which I condemn. As a student at Morehouse in the early 90s, much of my political awakening can be attributed to time spent on Spelman College campus. It was there where 100% of the classes for my theater major were held. Under the tutelage of the late wizard-like theater director, Glenda Dickerson, our playwriting teacher was a woman named Pearl Clegg. Pearl Clegg had recently released her book of essays and performance pieces called Mad at Miles, A Black Woman's Guide to Truth, in which she provides a handbook for women in abusive relationships with men. At the tender age of 19, what first stood out to me was how she explained that she could not listen to the muted tones of Miles Davis's trumpet without hearing the muted screams of the women he was notorious for beating and abusing. It was a lesson in a line being drawn between a man and his music. I remember her list of signs that a man might become abusive, like punching a wall during an argument, and her instructions to women on how to read body language and know when and how to get out of the room. Perhaps the most memorable day, memorable day in her class was just after the release of Dr. Dre's The Chronic. While walking across Spelman's campus, Ms. Clegg had been shocked to hear a song blasting from a young woman's jeep with the lyrics, bitches ain't shit but hoes and tricks. You know the rest. Her lecture that day, clearly improvised and mostly directed to the young women in the class, was not only a lambasting was not only improvised, but was not only lambasting the abuse of Dr. Dre, had heaped, the abuse that Dr. Dre had heaped upon beloved journalist Dee Barnes and bragged about, but also of what it might mean to develop an abusive relationship with music. I and many of my classmates were transfixed by the conversation that day. At the time, I was a dancer for a local rap group and spent countless hours on the dance floor in clubs, concerts, and parties. I'd enter a party and make my way to wherever the circle of hardcore dancers that drew onlookers had formed. I lived in those circles. Yet the conversation with Pearl Clegg had suddenly made me a critical listener of what I was dancing to. And I began not dancing to songs I judged as blatantly misogynistic as a form of protest against the pull of my body. I found this to be nearly as difficult as dancing off beat, primarily because some of those songs, like Bitches Ain't Shit, had appealed to me as the most intoxicating beats I'd ever heard. 
Until then, I had no raging critique of popular culture, yet there on the dance floor, or rather a little off to the side, resisting bullshit and music is where I began writing my first poems. Critical listening does not necessarily reflect prudishness. It simply opens the gates of considering whether a particular song or moment is worth it. You develop and nurture a radar and are perhaps less shocked, as abusers often tell you who they are. Like when someone pointed out on Twitter recently discussing the we should have known factor in revelations about R. Kelly self-referencing as the Pied Pet Piper, or Diddy naming his label Bad Boy, or D. Barnes who jumped in and quickly pointed out Beats by Dre. The fact is abuse and toxicity are clearly evident for those willing to acknowledge it long before court records become available to the public. I connect that lesson to this moment, for one, because the feeling of seeing the mass of your people move one way while your conscience forbids you from moving the same direction can be isolating and marks one deeply. It has nothing to do with being contrarian or a hater and more to do with being tiresomely sober. The sudden embrace of joy and black joy at the thought of having a black woman as the head of the American empire, while that empire, her party, and her current administration acts to literally annihilate Palestinian people while gaslighting about six ceasefire after having blocked four proposed by the UN, meanwhile trumpeting a Save Our Democracy slogan from the very real and malicious incompetence of Trump and the coordinated greed of the right-wing think tank that marches behind him is both valid and cynical due to the blight of genocide and the ways it has become ever so clear that it is not voters but donors, corporations, and the dated and racist strategic military interests of the U.S. empire that rule the decision-making decision -making of the Democratic and Republican parties. But it seems y'all heard when people show you who they are and forgot that it's the ones who smile in your face, not simply the ones who never hide it. Confronting abuse or patriarchy is certainly no less staggering than confronting empire. The blindness of the dance is the lack of acknowledgement of how it even came to be. The price of groceries did not become insufferable after October 7th, only the price of the ticket. Ms. Harris did not win a primary, nor has she in any way distinguished herself from her predecessor. If she were standing at the podium because of Biden's actual incompetence, then she would have already been sworn in by now. She is there, and some are dancing, because students, activists, and those who cannot or will not ignore the genocide of the Palestinian people have made it very clear that they will not vote for the perpetrator of the genocide. Joy cannot obscure the fact that without an arms embargo on Israel and an assertion of the will to follow and not ignore international law, the majority of U.S. voters are being held hostage by the Democratic Party, who is, in a very real sense, holding a gun to their head while slaughtering innocent people. This is clearly nothing to dance about. But alas, where we find ourselves today has very much to do with another group of people dancing for no good reason outside of a concentration camp. The most recent talking point has been that these were the leftists of Israel who purportedly dreamt of, I won't say free, but maybe loose Palestine, <laughs> better treatment. Though it does not appear that any Palestinians from Gaza or the West Bank had been invited to the party. Yet sometimes, we crash parties with uncomfortable truths. When Dr. Ruha Benjamin was honored at Spelman College last semester, she had the courage to say the now viral, black faces in high places will not save you. Yet perhaps we miss the point when we highlight the black faces in high places and don't interrogate the other half of the statement. Will not save you from what? What is it that we might need to be saved from? 
When the last poets released their searing critique of black American popular culture, niggas are scared of revolution. They said what they said, dated as it is, the critique holds true in many of the same ways that Dr. King confided his fears to Harry Belafonte of integrating my people into a burning house. Far too often, the delusional desire for a seat at the table attributes black faces in high places to the idea of progress when the only thing progressing is the violence of empire, where we are now afforded the luxury of having blood on our hands, too, in a mission that would just as soon eradicate us if and when the bottom line calls for it. If there is indeed some karmic retribution to be paid, for the role that white supremacists manifest destiny that animated the genocide and ethnic cleansing of the indigenous of Turtle Island, if there is karmic retribution to be paid for the racialized capitalism that enslaved tens of millions of Africans and continues to underpay and imprison with no retribution for time served, if there is karmic retribution to be paid for the rape of Puerto Rico, Hawaii, Haiti, the countless colonies, wars, theft that has been instilled, that has instilled racial, gender, and class hierarchies, how do we distinguish ourselves from those who should and must pay? Will not save you from what, we should ask? Is it the fact that those motherfuckers got what's coming to them? That it's out of our hands now? It's above me? I have no intention of telling you how to strategize your vote. I simply think that it's important that we acknowledge that it's not merely Trump and Project 2025 that should be animating an allegiance to a party that professes to be against right-wing book bans while refusing to tell the truth about Zionism and the brutal annihilation of Palestinians. That is overfunding and militarizing police as police violence has only increased since 2020 and building dozens of cop cities across the country for U.S. police forces to train with Israeli occupation forces. That is criminalizing homelessness while no longer pushing for Medicare for all. That is enacting America first abroad while lambasting it at home. These are some of the many inconsistencies of a political party that is dancing hand in hand with its power twin while holding the global majority as prisoners of its violent quest for resources and profit. And this is why many see it as extremely important that a third party like the Greens earn more than 5% in the upcoming election so that they can receive the federal and state funding that allows their candidate and more importantly their policies the, the attention deserved for the technology of awareness that says that in order to achieve democracy, US, politi US politics should identify as non-binary. However, although we cannot give Westerners the credit for inventing democracy, I do understand that for some, voting for a party, no matter how distinct or radical might be, seen as a reformist act an attempt at dismantling rather than burning down. Of course, and not simply because it's Native American Heritage Month, we should consider what our indigenous relatives might call a cultural burning or a good burning, a tool that was used to manage forests and replenish the land as a preventative to wildfires. The European colonial mind state saw this as primitive neglected to understand it are only now at the beginning of realizing the fortitude of ancient technologies to ecology, which include us, humanity. But maybe it's too late. Maybe we've ignored the teachings and voices of our relatives and our ancestors for too long. Over my dead body loses its force when clearly there are already too many dead bodies under the rubble, under prisons, under our skyscrapers, under our houses and residential schools. These are the fossils that fuel a system that depends entirely on us. Not just here in the Imperial Corps, but even more so in the countries whose resources the ruling class depends on. Maybe it should no, should no longer be a question of our dead bodies, but the discipline we impose on our living ones to withhold our labor. 
If you have not understood that power and its relationship to patriarchy and family and business and education and its relationship to capitalism, to living wages, to health care and basic services, in its relationship to white supremacy and its direct connection to visibility, suppression, news cycles, empathy, education, entertainment, that these forces have combined to enforce your silence on Palestine and all connected atrocities occurring now and way before now, recognized and unrecognized, known and unknown, foreign and domestic, if you do not realize that our talents combined, our voices combined, our monies combined, our dreams, our strengths, our love, our visions and imaginations combined, our labor could generate way more change than silence and fear, could generate a new world, an alternative energy that is not war, that is not material wealth, that is not comfort at the expense of. Then maybe you're listening to the wrong music, watching the wrong movies, reading the wrong books, hanging with the wrong crowd, studying the wrong lessons, laughing at the wrong jokes, jokes supporting the wrong causes, and don't get it wrong. The future we are fighting for is the sovereignty of indigenous peoples and lands here. It is to say that there is another future that the science fiction that imagines aliens coming to colonize Earth is just a projection of the colonial imagination. Yet there are higher frequencies, just as there is dark oxygen in the depths of the ocean that sunlight has not reached. When people say, these are dark days, I hear dark as powerful. Over 200,000 dead bodies in Palestine. How many more women will take their own lives to avoid rape in Sudan? How many more bodies in the Congo in its deep web of mines? How many more missing indigenous women? How many more trans lives? How many more prisoners as robots? Zionism is artificial intelligence. Artificial because it does not teach life, it takes it. Nakba, take one. Nakba, take two. But we were not supposed to see this. That's how I know it's our ancestors hacking the machines. The drum was the earliest form of wireless communication. It may not be true, but it sounds right. And that's how music works. <laughs> Imagine, the most powerful five days this earth has ever known. What would it take to convince your neighbor, your school teacher, your client, your manager, to say, we have the power to stop this if we do it in the millions, if we organize, regardless of who wins the election in solidarity with those here and abroad who lose either way. We are facing an extinction level event. The empire is exploding to prevent imploding. Yet the inevitable rise and in liberation of indigenous people of disenfranchised and marginalized people remains at the core of the fears of the empire. A lot of my friends and family who are sympathetic to the plight of Palestinians have consistently sent me reels and articles that boil down to, but Trump, but Trump. My response has been, these white people can choose whatever leader they want to helm their sinking ship. <laughs> And they respond, but Trump, but Trump. To which my question has always been, since when are we scared of white people? Thank you.